tuned for another episode of Crying Breakfast Friends. <laughs> Yeesh, I must be getting old. I used to like cartoons. Although cartoons might not be as entertaining as they used to be, some of them are actually quite educational and can still teach us new things. Welcome to my universe, I am Ben Ito, and today we'll be looking at 10 scientific facts mentioned in Steven Universe. The characters in Steven Universe can get nerdy sometimes, so I decided to compile 10 scientific topics mentioned in the show and I'll explain them in detail. What is nerd? Starting off with number 1. In this scene from the 36th episode of season 1, also known as Warp Tour, Steven seems to be allergic to the flowers in the flower meadow. This causes him to sneeze and have a runny nose. Uh, uh, you. <sighs> Sorry, Garnet. Oh, Steven, you're supposed to sneeze into your antecubital fossa. My what? Your... this thing? Yes, Pearl. Thanks for that new info. The connection between our upper arm and the forearm, also known as the elbow pit, is scientifically named as the antecubital fossa or the chelidon. Anticubital refers to this part of the arm, and fossa means a shallow depression or hollow. It has a triangular appearance and superficial veins pass through this area, making it an ideal spot for a doctor to draw a patient's blood, to place a stethoscope while measuring blood pressure, or of course, as Pearl said, for us to sneeze into in case we're not bringing any handkerchief or napkins with us. Number 2 this scene from the 14th episode of the Steven Universe Future series entitled Growing Pains tackled a serious issue about mental health, specifically about trauma and its effects. You seem to have made a series of miraculous recoveries, but that doesn't change the fact that you experienced trauma. You've recovered physically, but have you recovered mentally? You think there's something wrong with my brain? Not wrong! Yup, take note of that. Having and experiencing a mental health problem is definitely not wrong at all. It's that adverse childhood experiences or childhood trauma can have a lasting impact on how your body responds to stress. This can affect your social, emotional, and physical development. And this is exactly why having a mental health problem is not something that we only think about or feel. Our brain is programmed to remember things that will be useful for our survival and to help us remain safe in the future. When humans are in crisis, the brain releases the hormone cortisol. Your heart races, your muscles tense. I wonder if your body is reacting to a gem equivalent of cortisol. Think of this as our body's danger security alarm system. As we tend to remember difficult, painful, or scary things that are traumatic in nature, our brain raises its guard for similar events that might happen in the future. Our brain signals the glands in our body to release cortisol into our bloodstream in response to stress. As a result, our body is constantly on high alert, triggering the release of glucose from our liver to supply us with energy and every other effect described by Dr. Mahesh Waran. When something tragic happens, our brain takes note of this event. Write that down, write that down! We may remember the overall negative experience exactly the same way. Sometimes this memory just pops up out of nowhere, and sometimes all of it just floods our thoughts and it consumes us. This is the reason as to why and how there is trauma. Number 3 In this scene from the 18th episode of season 1 entitled Beach Party, while the crystal gems in the pizza family are playing volleyball on the beach, Garnet hits the ball too hard towards the ground and then this happened. We should probably move, huh? Yeah, we should. Whoa. Whoa. Did you know that when sand is superheated, it turns into glass? I did not know that. Well, if you play Minecraft, you do know that smelting sand gives you a glass block. But to explain why this happens in a simple way, heating sand is like cooking it. When you cook food, it doesn't turn back to its original state when you cool it. It becomes cooked food and the same way goes for sand. It doesn't turn back to the gritty yellow stuff you started out with. But instead, as you cook it, the silicon dioxide, which is what pure sand is made of, will crystallize and the impurities in the sand will be removed. Then, the molten sand's molecular structure changes from a complete solid to a half-solid, half-liquid material which is scientifically known as an amorphous solid. 
basically cooking sand turns it into crystallized liquid sand, that's why it appears transparent and it is clear because the impurities have been removed. Number 4 In this scene from the 19th episode of season 2 entitled When It Rains, Peridot was startled by the sound of thunder. Then Steven told her that it was just raining by explaining how it happens. It's happening! What else could be making that horrible? Ah! It's mounting on the earth from the inside! Oh, uh, that's just thunder! What? Yeah, everything is fine. It's just thunder. It happens when it rains. Uh -huh. Here, pretend this soup is the ocean. When the sun warms it up, the water evaporates into clouds, like the steam. And when the clouds get really heavy, it rains. So scalding liquid pours down from the sky? No, no, it's, it's just water. It can't hurt you. Steven's explanation is a pretty accurate representation of how it rains. Raining is just a step in a whole process that happens as a routine repeatedly. This process is known as the global water cycle, which is the continuous movement of water within the Earth and atmosphere. As the sun heats up most of the water from the land, the water turns into water vapor or steam. This process is known as evaporation. Then, the warm steam rises up because it's lighter, smaller, and less dense than the less warm or cold air that is currently surrounding us. And, it gathers into the sky as it floats, forming clouds. The water particles become heavier, denser, and bigger than the air particles in our atmosphere. When it is heavy enough for the water particles to float in the sky, it falls back into the ground as rain. This process is called precipitation, and it is now raining. After that the water is on the ground again, the process repeats keeping the water cycle running. Number 5 In this scene from the 20th episode of season 2 entitled Back to the Barn, while Peridot is discussing the cluster with the crystal gems and telling them that it's in the Earth's core, Peridot mentions the temperature and pressure of it as well. We'll need to build some sort of machine to take us to the center of the Earth. It'll have to- Hey! I wasn't finished speaking. What we need is to build some sort of machine to take us to the center of the Earth. It'll need to withstand up to 360 gigapascals of pressure and temperatures of 9,800 degrees. The temperature of 9,800 degrees must be in Fahrenheit because 9,800 degrees Celsius is too hot and inaccurate for the Earth's core. The values that Peridot mentioned are true and theoretically precise. It is theoretical because no one has ever been to the Earth's core to measure and obtain the exact values. Oh! However, they are based on scientific calculations and analysis from the readings of seismographs, making them reasonable and acceptable. These help scientists to conclude that our core is mostly composed of iron. This also allowed them to generate educated guesses on the temperature and pressure of our planet's core by using the exact melting point of iron in a condition similar to the Earth's core. With all of this, we have obtained the temperature and pressure of our planet's core. Additionally, it is later on revealed in the show, specifically in the 24th episode of season 2 entitled It Could Have Been Great, that the cluster isn't exactly placed on the Earth's core. But where is the cluster now? Hang on. There it is! It's embedded deep in the mantle. Relative to the barn, it's roughly 2,500 units down. Based on this image, the cluster must be in the mantle, since Peridot said it was only 2,500 units deep, which I believe is in kilometers. Since the mantle is known to be 2,900 kilometers thick, this indicates that the cluster is in fact in the mantle near the Earth's core. <laughs> 